This story begins on November 12, 1942, in Richmond, California. The cold morning fog hung low over San Francisco Bay, muffling the clang of hammers and the hiss of torches as a crowd gathered near the waterfront. Before them stood a complete cargo vessel, 400 and 41 feet long, weighing over 28 million pounds, ready to slide into the bay through the gates of the Permanente Metals Corporation. Yard number two. But this was no ordinary ship. It had been assembled in just four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. What once took six to eight months of expert craftsmanship had been accomplished in less than a week. The crowd of workers, more than a thousand of them, stepped back from the hull of the SS Robert E. Peary, not master shipwrights or old salts, but men and women who, only weeks before, had been farmers, teachers, housewives, and clerks. As the reporters jotted notes and flashbulbs popped, they realized they were witnessing something more than a ship launch. This was the beginning of an industrial revolution, an American revolution, born not from the battlefield, but from innovation, speed, and determination. A new kind of mathematics was being written, not in military strategy, but in production statistics that would decide the war's outcome. The story of this transformation began two years earlier, on December 27, 1940, when a man named Henry J. Kaiser signed his first shipbuilding contract. Kaiser was 58 years old, a construction magnate known for building dams, not ships. He had never built a ship, never run a shipyard, and yet he promised the U.S. Maritime Commission he would build 30 cargo vessels for within two years. The old shipbuilding establishment laughed. To them, Kaiser was a fool, an opportunist with no business in their world. But Kaiser didn't see ships as they did. He saw them as massive assemblies of steel, something that could be built the same way Ford built cars. When Kaiser's chief engineer, Clay Bedford, visited Ford's assembly line in Detroit. He watched chassis glide past stations where workers added one component after another, each person performing a single, simple task. Bedford came back to California with an idea that would change everything. What if ships could be built like cars? The traditional shipbuilders thought it was absurd. They used rivets, millions of them, each heated, hammered, and installed by teams of skilled men working in perfect synchronization. Kaiser proposed something radical, to weld ships together instead. It was faster, cheaper, and stronger, but untested at such a scale. Vice Admiral Emery Land, head of the Maritime Commission, doubted it would work. Welding that much steel was considered reckless. But the Allies were desperate. German U-boats were sinking ships faster than America could replace them. Britain's survival depended on supplies that weren't arriving. Against that grim backdrop, Kaiser's gamble was approved. Not because anyone believed in it, but because there was no other choice. From the muddy flats of Richmond, California, Kaiser's shipyard rose like something out of science fiction. It looked nothing like traditional shipyards with their towering gantry cranes and single narrow slips. This one was wide open, laid out like a car factory. Massive steel sections were built in separate areas, moved by rail, and lifted by giant cranes capable of hoisting entire ship modules into place. Veteran shipbuilders who visited were horrified. They said it violated every principle they knew. But they also couldn't deny that it worked. Kaiser recruited anyone willing to learn. Thousands arrived. Farmers, secretaries, high school kids, grandmothers. He trained them not for years, but for weeks. Each person learned one specific task. Welding a seam, aligning plates, or assembling bulkheads. 
By simplifying work into repeatable steps, he transformed ordinary people into an industrial army. In a matter of months, production time began to plummet. The first Liberty ship took 197 days to build. The next, 169, then 128. By spring of 1942, they were turning out ships in just 70 days. Traditional yards, with their old methods and proud traditions, couldn't keep up. Kaiser's revolution didn't stop there. He pushed for parallel production, building multiple sections of a ship at once. Instead of waiting for the hull to finish before installing engines, one team built the hull, while another built the engine and its mount elsewhere. When both were ready, a crane dropped the entire assembly into place in a single day. What used to take weeks was now done in hours. The naval establishment called it madness, but the results spoke for themselves. Vice Admiral Howard Vickery, who once fought against Kaiser's reckless shortcuts, eventually admitted defeat. Perfection, he said, is the enemy of sufficient. Kaiser's ships weren't beautiful, but they were built, they floated, and they carried cargo when it mattered most. Competition soon ignited between Kaiser's shipyards, his son Edgar managing the Oregon Yards and Bedford running Richmond. Each tried to outdo the other, breaking records again and again. By September 1942, Oregon had built a ship in just 10 days. Then, a month later, Richmond decided to attempt the impossible, to build one in less than half that time. At midnight on November 8, 1942, over a thousand workers began assembling the Robert E. Peary. Prefabricated sections were already staged. The bow, stern, engine room, and cargo holds all built separately and ready to go. Welders, fitters, and crane operators worked in rotating shifts around the clock. By the fourth day, the ship was complete. On November 12th, at 3.30 p.m., the Peary slid down the ways into San Francisco Bay. Fully built in just four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes, the crowd erupted. Vice Admiral Land, who once doubted the very idea, stood in stunned silence. Six months ago, he said, I would have called this impossible. Henry Kaiser has made traditional wisdom obsolete. What followed was nothing short of an industrial miracle. Other shipyards copied his methods. By 1943, the average Liberty ship took just 42 days to complete. America was now building three ships a day, faster than German submarines could sink them. Kaiser's success reshaped not just the war, but the workforce itself. His shipyards employed nearly 200,000 people at their peak. 40,000 of them were women. Rosie the Riveters, who proved that skill and courage weren't confined to any gender. Thousands of black Americans found good-paying jobs in integrated crews, learning trades that changed their futures forever. Kaiser didn't just build ships, he built communities. The city of Richmond exploded from 23,000 residents to over 100,000 in three years. In Oregon, he built Vanport City, a brand new town for 40,000 shipyard workers and their families. And to care for them, Kaiser founded a medical program that would one day become Kaiser Permanente, one of America's largest healthcare systems. By the end of 1945, his yards had produced nearly 1,500 ships over a quarter of America's total wartime output. In total, 2,710 Liberty ships were built across the country, carrying tanks, jeeps, ammunition, and food to every corner of the world. They were plain, slow, and boxy, but they were enough to win the war. Even after victory, the lessons endured. The modular construction and prefabrication techniques that Kaiser, 
pioneered became the blueprint for modern shipbuilding around the world, from Japan's Nagasaki, yards to South Korea's giant Hyundai facilities. His methods spread into housing, bridge building, and even aerospace. The idea that ordinary workers, properly trained and organized, could achieve the extraordinary became a defining principle of American industry. The Liberty ships themselves, designed to last five years, often served for decades. A few still exist today. The SS Jeremiah O'Brien sails proudly from San Francisco, and the John W. Brown remains in Baltimore as a living museum. Their riveted cousins from the old world are long gone, but these welded workhorses endure. When Admiral Chester Nimitz reflected on the war years later, he said, Japan's generals believed they could sink ships faster than we could build them. They didn't count on Henry Kaiser. That was the real secret of victory, not just courage on the front lines, but the relentless power of innovation at home. Kaiser's true legacy wasn't the steel ships he built. It was the idea that limits are illusions, that tradition isn't truth, that ordinary people, given the tools and the belief, can do the impossible. From the first contract in 1940 to the Robert E. Peary in 1942 to the final Liberty ship in 1945, Henry Kaiser and his workers didn't just build ships, they built proof. Proof that human ingenuity, when freed from old constraints, can remake the world. And that's why, decades later, every time a modern ship slides down its ways in half the time it once took, Somewhere in that thunder of steel and water echoes the sound of the Robert E. Peary's launch, a sound that told the world that the impossible had just been done.